is my favorite story. Okay, great. Okay, cool. Call back later. <gasps> you guys. We are diving into the Battle of Jericho is found in the book of Joshua. Welcome to another episode of Bible Stories with me, Brianda. Brianda. And joining me today, we got the new team, apparently. <laughs> uh, we got Al. Al over here, Alex Man. Media. What's up? What's up? What's up? How you doing, Al? I'm doing great. Color coordinated. Oh, thank you. I try. Yep, 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 yep. Um, mm -hmm. We've also got La Clara. Hi, how uh, are you? Our favorite Spanish girl. <laughs> how you doing, baby? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Girl, I am ready. I, I was telling Alex on the way here, I was on the train, and mm -hmm. I was listening to my gospel music, mm -hmm. uh, Maverick City Music, hello, um, and I felt the Holy Spirit tell me that I was going to take the passenger seat today. That doesn't happen often. I swear it doesn't. Even when I'm reading the Bible, sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes I'm reading it very, like, mechanical, mm -hmm. but sometimes... It feels like another experience. Sometimes it feels like a whole another experience. And that's how I feel like today's going to go. Maybe not. We may need some tissues. I don't know. Maybe not. I don't want to, you know, put that out there because I did do my makeup. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but anyways, guys, let's dive into some questions and uh, hopefully not piss off any other religious groups. Let's see. So I, first of all, this round of questions, great job, guys. I was pleasantly surprised. Normally I get like really silly questions, but I, I don't know where to begin. So Clara, mm -hmm. because you're here, our resident atheist, <laughs> I, I wanted to, this person asked me, uh, science versus faith. Can science prove God existence? Before I give my what my response would be. Again, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a theologian, I'm a regular girl, I'm an actor, I'm an entertainer who enjoys talking about philosophical ideas and shit. Um, but for you, how do you pose your first kind of uh, question about science in regards to faith when you're talking to, to someone of faith? Like, how do you pose it? How do you pose the question? What do you mean, my first question? What would your question be uh, when discussing science with someone of faith? Like, how would you pose the question? I we, we, I talk about it with people that are believers, but more so I could like learn their point of view, but I'm never trying to like... Oh God, you're them. nicer than me. I don't mm. know. Like, when I was an atheist, I used to poke holes. <laughs> yeah. well, I, like I said, it comes down to respect to me and I respect every position. It's just like, oh, why do you think like that? Fair enough. But unless you ask me like you're doing, but... You can ask, I think that you're right. You can pose questions and be respectful. I, I often find that people are dissuaded from even asking questions, especially like in social media today. If you ask anything, it's like offensive. No, 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 not that. It's not my ministry. Um, I get it. And I do ask questions when, like I told you, I grew up with a very atheist background. Like I never had any contact with the Bible. Same. So I do ask questions when I don't know what it's about just so I can learn mm -hmm. more, but not trying to question your beliefs or not trying to make you believe what I believe, you know, because I don't like when it's not to you. People so do you that don't want to do so I'm like, Okay. You know, well, but. the question was, can science prove God's existence? I asked you because as an atheist, I used to pose this to my believer friends and the way I would pose it is, uh, prove to me that God is real. Mm. That is what I would ask them. I would just shoot for the jugular. Like mm. I would just go there. Yeah. But I think that's very, uh, it's a very ambiguous, like it can give a lot of respond, like res replies to that question. Well, also now that I know better and now that I've done my due diligence and read the text mm -hmm. actively, cheers, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I now know that you cannot possibly answer that question. I think I would respond to, I would respond to it by uh, no science cannot prove it because well first of all i don't believe it exists so you can't prove <laughs> that something that you know doesn't exist exists but two if it did exist i would think that science would have already proven its existence like it's one of the biggest debates in history between believers and non-believers science been my phone down. <laughs> around for a minute okay like, listen listen guys we cannot prove with science of God's existence, it's a silly question. This is coming from someone who posed the question herself. You know, the text, our, our biggest, I'll say, we can't prove it, but 
as a Christian, it's our responsibility. When someone asks, poses questions like that, we are to give the person, the subject, the recipient, evidence as to how we can prove, uh, for example, let's just say, Christ's Christ that Christ is Messiah. Let's just use some some part of the Bible. That one, mm-hmm. I can't prove to you that that's true, but I can give you evidence. My evidence being one of two things, or both: anecdotal personal stories mm-hmm. that I know to be true, that mm-hmm. I've experienced, and that those around me have personally experienced. Of course, that one's going to be the first one to be knocked out because that's again anecdotal. Mm-hmm. The one undisputable evidence is the gospel. The canonical gospels, it's in the text. Now, the first thing they say is they don't want to read the text. They don't, they, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a, a credible enough source for them. Then I don't know what to tell you because that is our ancient source. Our evidence is in the text. So when I was an atheist, that would, a lot of the, my pastors and my friends around me would be like, you got to read the Bible. We can't, I can't, I can't show you or tell you anything other than that. And it isn't just blind faith, right? Like, even though in some stories we do mention that once you're already indoctrinated in, but you're actually reading and you're receiving it and you're accepting it because the proof is right here. Like in the, in the, for example, in the new Testament, damn it, high tangy or not high tangy in the new Testament, there are eyewitness testimonies from people who witnessed Jesus's resurrection. That is what's contested, right? Would you cut and and, I mean, let's just, oh gosh, let's just say, let's just say that I'm wrong Mm -hmm. and this is all, I I was wrong. At the end of the day, I'm following a doctrine that is a fallacy, is fantastical. Mm -hmm. The way I view it is I lose nothing, but those that don't believe lose everything if they're wrong. If I'm wrong, I lose nothing. If you're wrong, and I'm not just you, just anybody, if you're wrong, you lose everything. Pero yo no pierdo nada. Mm, That's a way of saying it. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm. And again, to answer that question, no, science cannot prove it. You can't prove something scientific. And also, don't act like that's a scientific question. That's not a scientific question. Uh, can science prove, unless science can prove God's existence, it isn't true. That's a philosophical question. Yeah, and it's like science, well, I don't think science can prove everything. Like, can science prove love? No. Ha! Wow. Same shit. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Yes. That's really profound. When I know, okay, how can you tell when you love someone? What's your first indicator? How do you know? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's like a, <laughs> it's a combination of things. But you, de- you never go to a scientific formula to find out if I can exactly. trust someone. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Like I trust Alex because I see the way he moves around other people. Mm-hmm. I see the way he behaves. Th- these are things that are outside of science. Science is one method to truth and a totally 100% valid m- method for knowledge and truth. And philosophy is a whole nother valid. One is not more, cr- it holds more credence than the other. And our forefathers, our great thinkers, the, the greatest polymaths of human history prove that. I mean, Galileo, Galilee, right? Mm-hmm. He has this expression, this quote that I heard the other day, and it was just so, so he just hit it right there. He says, um, the Bible, the Bible shows you how to go to heaven. It doesn't show you how the heaven goes. The text is not a scientific text. It's a philosophical one. Mm -hmm. And when you ask, can science prove the existence of God? You're not asking a scientific question. You're asking a philosophical question. So I guess the response will be no. Science cannot prove the existence of God. It can't. That, that's how I would answer that in short, right? But just to expound a little mm. bit on that, because that's, that's what gets, when I remember it as an atheist, those are the questions that like would keep me the furthest away from God. And I knew nothing about science. I was dumb. You know what I'm saying? I was I'm still dumb. And I have to, dude, last week we asked you about something. You were like, I believe in science. And then you're like, I mean, I'm not a scientific. Yeah, I mean, but you were honest. It's true. And it's true. But it's, it's like, true. wow, is that, what's, is that what's stopping you from reading the text? Is something that you yourself don't even know about? Come on. Fair enough. But at the same time time i could dive in more into science and become like could you i don't know that a better scientific knowledge to 
explain whatever. Either you're I right. Just, like, I'm not to doubt your intelligence. That was rude. But it, no, no, no. And I didn't mean <laughs> I didn't that. Take it like that. Good, good, good. <laughs> but I mean, either way, it would require you to dive in and study. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know? Like both ways, the same thing. Same. So like, it's, you, it's, it's, what, it's what happened to you also. Like before, or let's say when you got your calling and like you started wanting to like follow, you know, the Bible or whatever. Mm -hmm. you, from that point to today, you've done a whole lot of study of the Bible. So right now, you know more than you did of course. a year ago or two years ago. That's a good point. It's the same thing. Yeah. it. I don't think it's it's mu much like any other form of knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's a it's applied learning. Mm -hmm. You know, it's I'm not it's not just blind faith like but that's what prevents me from thinking that this is a cult. Because when you think, when people use it as an, as an insult, you know, you're just in a cult or whatever. That for me is like blind manipulation. Mm -hmm. This is so not that for me. This is like, no, I, I'm reading the text. I'm studying the word. I am receiving other people's gospels in a way that other people would study other philosophical things and or sci a science and other knowledge form. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, that's how serious I take it. I don't think it's like a cult because you can follow re religion if you wanted to just by yourself. Like you, you could have the Bible yeah. and just like read yeah. it and follow by yourself. You wouldn't have to like give to another human being. You know what I mean? Whether it's in a cult, you have to follow like a structure within yeah. that cult. You have to give back to a human being back there and you're not allowed to just study and learn by yourself if you wanted to. So I don't think it's a cult. All right, next question. Um, uh, la, 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 la. Oh, someone asked, how do you pray? And I just want to answer this one real quick because if you're listening to this and you're feeling like a little bit enticed to dive into the Bible, the best way to read the Bible is to have a quick little prayer before and after. And the way I started, because I used to hate the, the, like the formalities, that would be what would keep me away from it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you see me saying, hey, father, the reason why we have this, bu the, the phone bit is to he, like, make a relationship with God seem as approachable as possible. Like God is a phone call away. So th th at the beginning, ask, ask all the questions you have. If you, if you're, if you, if let's, for example, I'm not me, but I'm someone who listens to my show. Like, and I'm praying like mock interview, maybe close your eyes if you want, whatever you got to do, meditate on it, be by yourself for sure. Just pray on it and say, Hey, uh, Jesus, um, I never felt anything ever. I hear people around me talk about it and I think it's kind of cool. I've been listening to Bible stories and I hear that you're a faithful God and I hear it in the text. I read it in the text. I was wondering if you could show that for me. Could you show yourself to me for this time? Some, it's, it's as easy as that. You don't even have to keep the formalities. It's so, so much simpler than what we make it out to be. And essentially what you're doing there is meditating. Like, and the more you make it a practice, the more it comes easy, the more it's like natural. Yeah. It, it comes out so much more naturally. In fact, I mean, I mean, I don't like it. I mean, I, lose that. <laughs> I, I don't like it when people like add so much spice into prayer. It kind of, it makes me disconnect, hmm. you know? And I'm almost like, are you praying? It? I, mean, I question, are you praying? I don't know if you're praying or not, but it's on my job to doubt. You know what I'm saying? I'm still a babe in the faith, but um, what? that actually brings me to one of the questions that I, what? Had yesterday, had forgotten about it. What? If, how do you say omnipotente? Omnipotent. Uh, okay, so if God is so omnipotent and is like capable of connecting with every human being, you know, like a radio station, telepathy, mm -hmm. whatever. <laughs> why does he need um, Moses or people to... Prophets. Prophets, yeah. To like talk to the people. So why doesn't he like connect? Hey, everyone, you know, boom, just directly one on one. Oh, he is. We're just not paying attention. He absolutely is. And we all have access to him. And the reason why he selects certain prophets is very intentional. These are people with um, experiences, familial backgrounds, certain traumas and pains and things of that nature that allow them to even be susceptible to be exposed, open enough to receive it. He's very intentional with who he picks. And we, there's a story in today's episode of a woman who, uh, there's a reason why God picks her to do a certain role. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, uh, you, oh gosh, there was another thing that you had at the, at the top half of that question. Um, and, and in short, we all have access to him. It's just a matter of if we're paying attention or not.
And a lot of us aren't. Even Christians, a lot of Christians aren't. It's not. But can he make us pay attention if he wants to? Of course, but you got to meet us halfway. You got to meet him halfway. Like, how can you put your trust and faith in something that you yourself aren't actively seeking? But seek and you shall find. Ask the questions and you'll find it. Yeah. But ask the question. And also when you're praying, God already knows what's in your heart. Mm. You're, you're not giving God any news. You're, you're revealing your heart to yourself mm. in prayer. Does that make sense? Yes. You know? And I understand the meeting halfway, but what about like agnostics, for example? We're like, oh, I don't. So I, for me, agnostics I get it. Are, like, you know, put some on your part if you want to, you know, learn about it or mm -hmm. try to connect or whatever. But with agnostics, we're like, yeah, it might be, might not be. I'm not really sure. Or people that really question. I don't know. It's like, it's just, just, you know. I almost find <laughs> agnosticism to be an even, <laughs> they're an even tougher like thing to crack because being on the fence isn't always great. Being on the fence sometimes, for example, with me, I was, I remember my like little window of maybe I was a little bit agnostic, mm -hmm. but really it was a stark change. It, I it went from unbeliever program, to the, yeah. but I remember that little window of time and the toughest part, I don't have the answer to that question, to be honest, but I remember the toughest part was when you're treading on both sides, you kind of lose your own your, your identity in anything. You end up doubting both parties and you end up becoming, you, you end up like becoming a recluse to your own self. Mm. That's why I almost, I have, I have better discussions with my atheist friends mm. than I do with my agnostics friends. What? Are no, you lost, no, Alex? I don't know about all that. Are you Listen, lost? Because he is it. Listen, yeah. that's because you're you agnostic. <laughs> Go find yourself. <laughs> Go find yourself. Go pray. <laughs> I was just saying, I got to give Alex a Bible. I want to give the both of you guys a little Bible just to like have there if you want. Please, Please don't like use it a, as a coaster. A brand yeah, Bible don't. with Rihanna uh, memory, would, like I a souvenir. Merch! <laughs> yeah. Merch is my face on the Bible. No. Oh my God, oh my never. God. Yeah, you can't no, do no, do not do that. Oh God, please forgive me for that. I did not mean that. That was a bad joke. <laughs> Oh my God, these feathers are getting me hot. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, do, <laughs> do we have time for another question? Let's see. Um, how do you know when you get the feeling when you get the call? This could be the, the last question. And obviously this is different. You haven't had the call. Mm. How do you know when you get the feeling? Oh, that's a tough one. Oh, my, why did I pick that one? <laughs> you got to be high uh, on acid or something? Um, uh. No, <laughs> but I think that psychedelic medicine is, uh, definitely exposed me to a lot of things that I otherwise may not have uh, been privy to as quickly mm. with the intensity. Mm. I would have gotten there anyways. And I believe that to be true had I continued praying, had I continued going to church. But th that first calling feels like a, a deep remembering. The, the way I ended last week's Deuteronomy episode, like I wrote that kind of, I took it out of my journal. Like it just feels like a deep knowing some people actually hear it, like audit, auditory, they actually hear it. For example, today on the, in the, on the train, I heard something, but that's something that took me three years to develop. I was not there at the beginning. At the beginning, it was a, a feeling. It was intuition. I'm not going to like act fake and be like, I saw colors and whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, it just felt like a deep, familiar feeling. And the reason why so many people like seek God when they're down in the dumps when they don't know when they're going to get their next meal, when their parent is about to die. But the reason why, why those people, why God caters to the lowly is because there it's such a, a vulnerable, open, wounded space. That's where God sits in and, 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 and wiggles his way and sits right there. That's why he, uh, God caters to the lowly. So anytime you're in a place of discouragement or deep anguish, Sadness, ooh, it's gonna sound really messed up to say now, but that's the breeding ground for, for a calling. Like uh, uh, you utilize that, whether, whatever you wanna call it, but meditate, meditate on that. And who knows, you may feel a calling for yourself. So I hesitate sometimes of chiming in because I'm afraid to offend. I have a skeptic mind where like, for example, you just said on the train, you actually heard something and like me i'm like all right there are psychotic people that also hear voices so what's the difference of you 
being psychotic or are you hearing from the Lord? That's a good one. I don't think that's offensive at all. I don't think that's offensive. I don't think that's offensive. I, you know, I, can I urge you to saying like maybe you're just psychotic. No, no, no. I don't. And no. here's the thing. I don't. So when you were to, when you were to if you were to pose that question, yeah. I know I'm not psychotic. <laughs> See, like, how do we know if we're psychotic? That was a joke. That, that was a joke. Yeah, so, no. <laughs> I've actually mentioned this in previous uh, episodes. When I see, you know, homeless people, we live in New York City, and yeah. homelessness is at an all time high, and in LA too, and in the, in, in, and in the Bay. Um, and sometimes I see, more often times than not, I see them having conversations with themselves, mm-hmm. and I think, oh my gosh. What if Maybe they're, talking they're having a full on blown conversation with God? What if they know things that we don't? Now, the reason that prevents me from thinking it's an agitated psychosis is because of the deep sensation of um, like something's connecting here. If anything, I feel the most sane and fulfilled and i feel like i feel so safe and sane mostly when i am experiencing god's presence whether it be auditory which like i said doesn't happen often Mm -hmm. but when it does i i clock it and i just journal about it i write about it i try and record it i feel way too at home to feel like i'm at the brink of losing my sanity that's my experience And also for those that do have an agitated psychosis and they are speaking, they may be speaking to God. Yeah, you're right. And sometimes I think that our intellectual minds, these developed three pound masses of fat that we have in our brain, sometimes that can cause us a disservice and a disconnect to God, if we're being honest. As we discussed in Deuteronomy, when Moses says that the thinking mind is sometimes the thing that causes us the most division Mm -hmm. from God. It's just a matter of where you find your truth. What is truth to you, right? I don't think that this is all that there is. So no, I think that, I think that to, to, to say, oh, agitated psychosis, psychopathy, I think that would be unnecessarily reductive. I think it's a big spectrum, not only like sane or psychotic, like there's, and I also think that um, the mind is very powerful. And it can trick yourself. Do you believe in the mind? Here, mind to the soul. Psychology, no psychology. Like the the brain, like the muscle. The, I always like wonder the what chemicals the is. in the, like the chemicals in the brain, whatever. Like it's very powerful. And sometimes I'm not saying okay. you didn't hear anything, but it can make people believe that they see or they hear things or they experience things right. and it's not true. Like in the moment I was listening to gospel. I was in a prayer. Mm-hmm. I was like lubed up for whatever was about to come. Mm-hmm. Um, however, I believe, I know from experience, I know that that was the voice of God. And that sounds foreign to those who've never experienced it. I know I was there. Mm-hmm. I remember hearing other people talk to me about those experiences and be like, this is just crazy. <laughs> like what? But when you know it, it's a deep knowing. It feels like I already experienced it. Have you guys ever felt deja vu? Mm. Yeah. You felt deja vu? Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Imagine that. Multiply it by 10. Amplify it. That is what it is. It's like this, this is like anomaly, this weird experience that humans have. Do other animals experience things like deja vu? I doubt it. You know what I mean? So... And you wouldn't be offending me, uh, Alex. This is my show. Mm -hmm. So if you're offending someone who's listening, there's nothing we can do about that. They're not in the room. Mm -hmm. But please, I urge you to ask them. And ask them when it happens. Like, it's all, to me, it's all about the way you say it. You just put it in like very respectful way. And it's like a genuine- It could have been more respectful. (laughs) (laughs) No, No, but I'm not easily offended. (laughs) I want to create- I want to create a group of listeners, like a little tribe, Mm -hmm. a little Israelites, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) That aren't easily offended. Like if there's, if there's one thing I want for these people, it's to obviously find Christ, um, but to not be easy, not be easily offended. That's not going to be useful in discussions like these. Mm -hmm. I want you to hit me, hit me. And then if I don't have the answers to them, I'll make sure to get them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If anything, I like that. It keeps me sharp. 
Mm. Let me know. So let me dive further into the text. Let me go have longer discussions with my pastors and those that know more than me. Like right now, that question, now I want to go like call up my pastor and hear what he has to am say I about crazy? that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh my God, am I so hot? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Oh, wait, Alex. Did you respond to on the train when you heard? <laughs> Like, did I answer? Did yeah. I respond? Could you imagine? No, I didn't. But when I'm don't by myself it. in my room, <laughs> when I'm by myself in my room, I'm, I don't, I'm not necessarily like, he, have I ever? I don't know. Like I said, the auditory stuff doesn't really hit, but like the sensations do. You mm. see, you guys know, I cry a lot. Mm. That's not just coming out of nowhere. And it's, there's, a, I'm an actor, not because of like, I want to be on screen and whatever. No, because when I tell stories, I'm literally like, I experience these emotions and stuff in, I know that that's Christ too. Like that's God conjuring up these emotions in me. I'm a hyper emotional being and I'm no longer embarrassed about it. I just let others know so as to not make them feel uncomfortable. Like I don't want them to think that I'm in deep despair or anything. It's just how I communicate, mm -hmm. you know? Anyways, mazel tov. Let's, uh, that was a good, que paso? Over it. There's feathers on your... Yeah. There you go. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> These feathers gotta go. I it's may hot in here. I may pull I may okay, you guys. I may take the feathers off for half of this because it's way too fing hot. And now it's time for the moment we've all been waiting for. The Battle of Jericho starts now, guys. The book of Joshua is a is known in the Bible as one of the history books. We just got through three weeks of heavy laws, right? We made it guys. Now we're back into some fun. Now, Joshua, in terms of timing, we, all, we just left Deuteronomy. Moses has just died after 40 years in the wilderness. You know, God was waiting for that old um, disobedient generation to die off so that the new generation can inhabit the promised land. So roughly just to give you guys a time estimate, we're looking at around 1400 BC when Joshua begins. So that is, if my math is mathin, that's around uh, 2,500 years after Adam and Eve. And every so often I'm gonna bring in some timestamps because I know that when I'm reading, it helps me with like the scope of, of time. So many people tuning into Bible stories didn't know just how much of a linear like story. They didn't know that there was this long mm. uh, uh, tail you know, it, the Bible is cool, guys. Please read it, especially Joshua. And on this episode, we are going to, uh, we're going to do it in chunks like we used to do with the first 10 episodes of Bible stories. Today, we're going to dissect chapters one through five-ish. You guys know how I feel about ish because sometimes I pull from the one after, sometimes I pull from the one before. So Joshua was Moses's right-hand man. And we left off with Moses passing the torch on to him. And you guys know from before, Joshua was one of the two spies that Moses sent over to Canaan to scope out the land. So basically it's Joshua and his buddy Caleb and their descendants. They're basically who comprise the new generation that inhabit the promised land. Because they were the only two that listened, right? They were the only two of the spies that did not say, we're going to die, guys. We're not going to make it. They're yeah. the ones that didn't operate from fear, but, but from faith. Gotcha. And God saw, saw that and saw favor in them. So Joshua uh, it was from one of the smallest tribes. Remember in, uh, not in Leviticus, you guys weren't here for Leviticus, but in Numbers, we were discussing how each camp had different tribes. Mm -hmm. Joshua was from the tribe of Ephraim, which was one of the smallest tribes that was a non-Levite, because, you know, Le Levites are super important, the priests, which is super cool. It reminds me of like, you know how people from a small town become famous? Mm -hmm. Could you imagine like being like, oh, that's my boy, Joshua, look at him doing his thing. <laughs> but because he was from such a small town, you could imagine Joshua was nervous. You know what I'm saying? Like he had to follow Moses? Like that, I, I'm nervous for him. So in chapter one, God tells Joshua, not once, not twice, but three times, be courageous, be courageous, be courageous. And you'll know, you guys, if you guys are reading the Bible, if God repeats things, he's not just doing that arbitrarily. That is intentional. And not only that, the people of Moses also encourage him too, but let's go to scripture. Scripture, Joshua one, chapter one, verse nine. Have I not commanded you? 
This is the Lord to Joshua. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So sweet. Could you imagine anyone reading the text and being in a state of discouragement and like uneasiness and they read that? Oh, like just when you need it. But also not to dampen the mood, but the people of Israelites who were like, yeah, Moses, just be strong. Just be, you know, like you got this. We're going to believe in you like we believed in Moses. Oh, shut up. They're capping. Like you did not. You gave Moses such a hard time. And now you're going to be like, oh, be courageous too. What do they say? Oh, yeah. It, verse 16 to 17 of the same chapter, the people are like, um, whatever you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. Exactly. <laughs> this is the people of Israelite. Like, mm. go get, stop it. Stop it. But it's important to note that they're at a point right now where they're kind of scared. So they're like, listen, we may not mean what we say, but we sure gonna act like it <laughs> to your face, right? And also they don't want Joshua to be scared <laughs> like, because then they may in turn die, <laughs> you know? So I think another part that's really important to note is what they're gonna do, what the mission is. The mission is Joshua is going to lead this new generation into Canaan because Canaan was a wicked land. I think we touched on it a little bit before. They worshiped idols. They were sexually immoral, but worst of all, they sacrificed children. Like mm -hmm. that was a, a common thing in the land. Yeah. So the mission was in order to inhabit Canaan, the Israelites had to take them out. Ooh. And yeah. Which I know that that may sound a little, you know, uh, uncomfortable for some people. Like, is God asking, is God asking the people to be genocidal? Like, is this genocide? Is this a people clean, cleansing? And I'm going to leave that. kick them out. He didn't say kill them. Oh, no. no we're going to kill them. He said kill them? Yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah. And I'm not one to sanitize a story. Like, I'm going to tell you what the text says. The text says to kill him off. Um... There's no, I'm not gonna, you know, sugarcoat it. Uh, but if you, it's just the perspective and how you read it, right? Like these people were a wicked people. They were not good people. And it's outside of the fact that they worshiped idols, which is very important. Like they were automatically sinners. How could we trust these vulnerable Israelites to be among them? They themselves alone fail in the desert with no one else. <laughs> they were failing. So you're telling me that you put them in a bunch of sinners? They're not gonna they're not gonna sit? They're not gonna hit the strip club with the second they go in <laughs> with the Canaanites? Like, no. You know what I mean? So that's why that's why the mission was what it was. And um, I'd love to hear leave in the comments below like what you guys think uh, about that. But um, that was the mission, and that's the only way that they were going to take the promised land, which was the land that God promised. Therefore, fulfilling the prophecy, fulfilling the covenant that God made with them. So I also wanted to uh, um, dive into my, how do I say this? There are five stories in the Bible that are my go-to, like when I'm on the plane, when I'm traveling, when I'm in the gym, sometimes I'll like audio, listen to it, five different stories. We're about to dive into one of my favorite stories, top five favorite biblical stories. Okay. 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 One of my questions from the top, and I didn't answer it because of this reason alone. She asked me what, or what Bible story speaks to you the most. And it's the one that I'm about to talk about right now. And it happens in Joshua chapter two. So we now know what the mission is. We now know what the plan is. Joshua has already told the leaders, like, this is what's good. This is what's going to happen. He even told the, the, the tribes that were going to be on the outskirts of the, of the promised land. He was like, all right, y'all can be on the outside, but your strongest leaders are going to have to go into war, go into battle with us. Just let y'all know. And then you can go back out. Once those discussions were had, Joshua sends two spies over to the land of Jericho, which was a land east of the Jordan River, Jordan. And if they were going to take over the entirety of Canaan, they were going to start with Jericho because they were right at the border. Mm. So it made logical sense why that would be the first land that they were going to take over. So Joshua sends over two spies. And I think it's kind of cool that he's kind of learning from his mentor, Moses. 
Mm. He, yeah, you know, to send over the, because he, what they need is to get a, an accurate layout of the land because they need to catch them when they're not off guard. We're dealing with people that are huge over there. We're dealing with, you know, savvy people, clever people mm. with dark magic and stuff like what? So we need these spies to not only make it, we need them to be safe and we need them to get an accurate layout. But what I think is kind of cool, and this is how you should be reading the Bible, like actively, is that unlike Moses, because he's correcting what Moses did, Moses sent over 10, remember? Mm -hmm. He sent over two, because he knows that if you send too many people out there, they go a little crazy. Too many champ, but two, the likelihood of one of them either dying, but the likelihood of them coming back and um, doing the same thing that they did before, which was spewing out fear and stuff, that's the kiss of death. Like we said before, the second one person spews out something, a fear, fear mongering statement, like a cancer, it spreads. So that's cool that Joshua knows what Moses did, but he's going to do something a little different this time. I just thought that was so neat that he's already, he's wise, but it's not just because Joshua is wise. The Holy Spirit is working through him. That's God giving him insight. Send to, you know, is he psychotic? Hmm? <laughs> Anyways, so uh, let's dive into scripture. Joshua chapter two, verses two to three. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to a woman, a very important woman, one of the most important women in the Bible. And her name was Rahab. The spies end up going to Rahab. Rahab, Rahab. Rahab. Oh, yeah. He definitely psychotic. He went through the rehab and everything. <laughs> like, wait, hold on, what's going on? And this is your favorite story too? <laughs> no, Rahab. Her name is Rahab in the story. And I, 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 I jumped the gun with going into scripture, but the spies end up going to uh, this woman's house that was the outskirts of Jericho was divided by a, a border and the border, they were like double border. If you guys are watching the YouTube, you can see my hands right now. It's a double border. Rahab lived in between the border, which coincidentally was the perfect spot for them to camp out so they could scope out the scene. You know, it also was where poor people, poor people would, would lived. The rich people lived inside. Now here's the thing about Rahab. Rahab was a pagan prostitute. Okay. So some people, I'm not saying it's me. I'm not saying it's me. I repeat, I'm not saying it's me. <laughs> are saying that one of my other spies, maybe the spies, were, maybe the spies were a little horny. I don't know. I'm not saying that, and I don't believe that. I'm just providing you with some 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 salacious stories because I have a podcast and I'm trying to get my views up. Mm -hmm. But the spies <laughs> go to Rahab's house and uh, seek lodging through her. And Rahab tells them, oh my gosh, I've heard about you guys. Rahab tells these guys, oh no, you guys are the Israelites? Come on in, come on. So she goes to lodge them, she houses them. And all of a sudden we hear the king of Jericho, they go, hey, we hear some Israelites are in here. Like the, the word gets out that there are intruders in the land. Mm. So Rahab goes, all right, you guys, you guys have to go to the roof. Go, 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 go. She hides him in the roof. And then the officials, the Jericho officials come in, they knock on the door and they're like, hey, you, we hear that there are like some Israelites in here. And she goes, hey, no, no there's no people here. They, they come. I did not know that they are Israelites. They left over there. They move over there by the gate. They're not here. Trust me. I don't know. What, what the, accident? Uh, what you accident? Know what? <laughs> you know, I don't know who I'm offending, <laughs> but Rahab ain't here. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, she tells them and she's such a good liar. I don't know if sex workers are good liars, <laughs> but she answered with the swiftness. I bet you the spies were like, damn, this girl's good. <laughs> like she just answered it so well because I'm assuming that's not the first time that she's had to lie to a man. Mm. You or know? a woman. Or, or a wife. A, or a woman. But hey, listen, if that's her hustle, she's going to have to do what you got to do in that's order to make way. Yeah. So after she sends him off, she goes back to the spies. And she goes, all right, y'all, they're coming for you. I, I dodged I dodged them. So you guys have a couple, you guys have a window of time, but I just want to let you guys know something. I've heard stories about what God has done for the people of Israelite. She goes, I heard that he split the Red Sea. Is that true? Like all, all these things, message of what happened 
got to her, a pagan woman who was not a Hebrew, like what? I mean, she's in touch with a lot of people, you know, I would be surprised if it got to someone who's more isolated, but true. You know, a prostitute is in touch with a lot of people, not necessarily only from her city. True, 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 true. You also can imagine that someone who is where she is at the entrance of Jericho, she probably houses a lot of people from other lands. So that may be how she learned about mm -hmm. the word of God. But you know, we live in a time where there's phones and stuff. Like that. This is ancient times. Mm. So the fact that it even the messages got to her with that level of clarity is so neat to me, especially to any Bible readers, because mm. that's what this is. We are trusting God and people's good faith and people's honesty. That's, that's, that's why this is our ancient source. But uh, let's hop into uh, scripture. So let's dive into scripture to uh, figure out what Rahab tells the two spies. Chapter two, verse 10 through 11. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sinog and Og, the two kings of the Amorites. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord, your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. This is a pagan Canaanite prostitute, poor woman who's probably never read any kind of biblical text, has no direct connection to this, or whatever. But she had so much faith in that that was true. Like the fact that, so, that, 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 that God would even call someone like, the fact that she's a heroine in the story is unusual. And there are some people who say, oh, she wasn't a prostitute. She was just a servant. She was like, it's like, no, the text says she was a harlot. The text says she was a prostitute. And who knows, maybe we needed that level of that, that kind of person to get this message across. That message that it doesn't matter what your past looks like or what sins you've made in the past. No one's sins can thwart God's grace on you. Nobody. God's grace will always prevail. And it even prevailed on this, on this woman, like who changed the course of history. Because if it weren't for her, those men would have gotten caught. And the two spies wouldn't have been able to report with that level of accuracy. This woman was a hero. Oh, and when I read that, I remember thinking like, hi, Tanji. Um, <laughs> like as someone who was not of faith, and I think some of the biggest things that I repent about, and I haven't said this before, but like are the fact of that I spent so many years denying God and I'm only denying God. I spent so many years saying God wasn't real. And, and I know that atheists have every right to say whatever they say, but now that I'm on the other side, that haunts me. And I probably pray for it every other day. Like, it just goes to show me that, like, no matter what your sins are, God can still use you. I'm not supposed to have a Bible podcast. Just like she wasn't supposed to be this hero. But I trust that this is a part of a bigger purpose. Mm. Like that sounds so freaking wishy wishy. But when I hear the story of Rahab, it hits, man. We're not perfect. We don't have to be, you know, we don't have to be to, to help shepherd people along, man. And I'm curious to know you, maybe later, maybe you can read the text. It's just one chapter. Mm -hmm. Actually, believe it or not, this is a, the high tangy's over, but Rahab is, uh, spoken about in four other parts of the Bible. Um, I, I believe it's in Hebrews 11. Uh, they say, they reference her, her faith. Like no one had as much faith as her. There are people who knew the Bible left and right, but didn't have the amount of faith that Rahab had, you know? And in the book of Matthew, where there's that long genealogy of the line of Jesus, mm -hmm. Rahab is related to Jesus Christ. Mm. she's actually like Jesus's great, 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 great. I don't know the, the generation, but um, great, great grandmother, mm. which is so nutty to even oh. think about. She's a part of the holy line. Someone who was not even a Hebrew 
am I, is this not landing? Like, I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's cause I'm like too much of a believer and I'm in a room with non-believers guys. <laughs> Tough crowd. I feel like I'm bombing. <laughs> but, but it's just so cool that this woman who was not supposed to be a hero ends up being the, one of the biggest heroes in Joshua. Anyways, chapter two for you guys who want to tag along on the story of Rahab. Cause it's, it's honestly so cool. Wait, I'm not even done. Um, she tells them, listen, I saved you, but, and I think this is cause she was a sex worker and she's smart. She goes, but y'all gotta promise me something. Y'all gotta promise me that when y'all come back and mess Ish up and burn Ish down, y'all gotta promise me that you're not gonna kill me and my family. Like, how do I know that that, how do I know that y'all aren't gonna mess me up? <laughs> and they go, no, man, what you've done for us is, is dope. We're going to let Joshua know. We're going to let the people know. So long as everything works out, you got us. You got our word. And in the Bible, like a word means something mm -hmm. in life. Mm -hmm. Me, I, I, my friends, if we, we all got a lot of flaws, but if it's one thing me and my friends are going to do is we're going to show up. And that's how these major uh, characters in the Bible are too, until they fall, which happens all the time. Um, but the, the two spies say to her, Here's what you got to do. You guys have to hang a scarlet cord outside of your building, outside of her home. That way, when they come in and bomb Jericho, when they barbecue the people, they'll know to skip your house. Mm. You just have to hang that scarlet cord. Hmm. And then the two spies end up like Rapunzeling out of her house and go back to, to uh, Joshua. And he ends up telling Joshua like, yo, we met this prostitute. She's real dope though. Uh, didn't suck her dick. <laughs> oh my God, I'm so terrible. I'm cutting that out. Oh my God, my mom would kill me. But they end up reporting back being like, when we go back, we have to spare her. So at this point, all of the leaders know about Rahab and they know that they cannot bomb her house. She's gonna be the only family spared. And we later find out that the Hebrews adopt her in. Like that's, that's obviously why she's related to Jesus. She ends up immersing herself in the Hebrew culture. She is like God's adopted child and all of us can be. I feel like I was God's adopted child. Like I'm not meant to be here, but I am. And I love God and I love Jesus anyways. So this could either stay in or not, but so far the three women I know from the Bible is no prostitutes. two prostitutes <laughs> and Jesus' mother. Mm-hmm. That's a beautiful Love observation. Like, fucked by a pigeon, no? Something like Mary that. Mary Magdalene, the Samaritan woman, and now you're now you know Rahab. Yeah. Why do you think that is? I don't know. You tell me. Is he calling us all prostitutes? Of course not. What would give you that impression? I don't know, because if every woman No, because that he's then just... there's also Deborah the judge, who is one of the most pro, like uh, was a prophet who the, no. So okay. in, sh in short, no. Okay. But you don't know that because you you know you haven't read the Bible. Yeah, how, that's why I'm not. But I venture to say it's just like what I said before. God is intentional and deliberate with who he picks to execute certain missions. And these were women at a time that were poor and were um, bottom of the barrel. And I'm not saying that because they were women, it's because in the time, that's what their reality was. Mm -hmm. So could you imagine not having anything, not knowing if you'd make it to tomorrow, maybe questioning even making it to tomorrow? I would say God used these women as messengers for his word because they were probably in deep seated prayer and meditation, even if they didn't know that that's what it was. God recognizes an open heart. And the common thread about all these women was their receptiveness, their open hearts. Would the king's daughters, let's just say the king of Moab, the king of whatever, and I'm not trying to falsify characters. I'm just trying to think of a theoretical. A woman who had affluence, a woman who had nothing but excess. It's easy. I'm, I, I'm gonna venture to say, it's gonna be harder for her to tap into certain parts of her humanity when you've only known abundance, mm -hmm. when you've never known struggle. There's a humility that comes with not having much. Mm -hmm. God favors the lowly, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, maybe we'll keep that in, who knows? That's a solid question though. And um, it's, not a, it's not an accident. I don't think it's accidental. And these women that they didn't have any other options but to use their bodies in these ways. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Not to say that they were, that this was something that they took pride in. We don't know that. 
They didn't have Instagram. Oh, you don't have to. It's just like, but yeah. it would still be looked down or like rejected yeah. for that. Meanwhile, everyone's still using their services, which is like mm-hmm. very hypocritical. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then judging them and calling them mm-hmm. certain things. I would cry out to God every weekend, <laughs> every Friday night. After I had to blow off Steve, hairy ass, ugly, fat Steve, I would be crying to God like, God, ayúdame, por favor, dime, mm-hmm. like, te suplico, give me direction, give me guidance. That's when the God penetrates. You know what I'm saying? It takes that kind of heart. Mm. Man, but it's, 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 it's an interesting observation that the biblical heroines were these, one would say, you know, harlots, mm-hmm. that, you know? I don't know. But then I can't wait to get to, to one of the judges, Deborah, who's the, it's the opposite, or Ruth, or Esther, all these other uh, prominent female figures uh, in the Bible. Like, they weren't, they weren't uh, harlots by definition, right? But they were equally as important, mm. you know? Okay, so now that the spies have reported back, they gave Joshua the rundown of the land. Now... We're getting ready to round the troops and we're about to cross the Jordan to, to get down to business. Now, this part of the text is pretty neat because it displays God's um, power in such a way that's uh, comparable to when God split the Red Sea for Moses. Because these people, the Israelites, are still carrying the Ark of the Covenant. What's the Ark of the Covenant? Literally, what was at the center of the tabernacle, because I told you that the tabernacle's mobile, they move, it, they move it around. The Levites are still carrying this thing. They're literally carrying where the, 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 the tablets, like the actual covenant, the promises, the commandments. The Levites have to carry the, these things and they have to be very precious about it. So in order for them to get to Jericho, they have to cross the Jordan and ugh, God is so great. So during the Red Sea, he parts them and then they walk. But for Joshua and the gang, and especially the Levites, probably Kohathites, carrying the, the Ark of the Covenant, they had to dip their feet first in the water and then the water would stop. I, I, that distinction is, is kind of cool because it's like a metaphor for, uh, courage like you're just gonna have to dive in and trust that it's gonna stop with the red sea it split before so you saw it. you could see the ground and then you started walking at this point it was a little different at this point god wants you to practice exercising your courage because you're gonna need it baby you're gonna need it before the battle of jericho i thought that was so neat also at this at this point in the text god also sees his Israelites, you know, as they're crossing, I could imagine like, God is probably like, oh my goodness, these are my children. They're doing what I told them to do. My baby. Look at them behaving. <laughs> <laughs> and, we, and then he refers to them as for the first time, he refers to them as the nation of Israel. Normally he re- re- refers to them as the people, the people of Israel, all oh, the you stiff necked people. But this for the first time we see God refer to them as the nation of Israel, which I thought was pretty cool. And for me, it was like a nice little break in the Bible. Like, oh, okay, guys, they're doing okay. Now, after they pass the the Jordan, they also experience or not experience, they celebrate their first Passover in this new land. They're no longer eating the mana bread from rocks and stuff. They're eating the the produce, the fresh fruits and, and grains from the land, which I think is so cool that God timed that out perfectly. Like he knew exactly when to stop with the mana so that when they got to the land, they could eat from it and celebrate with him. Because what do we know about celebrating? Celebrations, it's a moment to remember. Mm-hmm. It's smart, it's a smart. It's not just have fun, each other chat with your friends. Like, no, we're using these celebrations intentionally so that you may be in communion with your family and remember what God has done for you before. Remember, God just stopped the Jordan for you. Remember what God has done for you because he will show up again. Very intentional. God is very intentional about his timing. And it's at this point that Joshua leads the people past the Jordan after the celebrations. And all of a sudden, he sees a man with a sword up ahead. And he goes, huh? Who are you? 
Joshua asks him, are you one of us or are you one of them? <laughs> and this guy with the sword says, neither. Mm. Y'all, I read that and went, oh, who is he? What, is he? what does he mean by that? It turns out this man was God incarnate. A theophany is what we call it biblically, or like if you're studying the Bible, it was God incarnate. And the reason why some people say that it was an angel, not God, not the Lord, but I beg to differ. And here's why, because at this point, when he says, neither, I am the commander of the Lord. The first thing Joshua does is get to his knees and goes, oh my God, thank you, Father. Oh my God, all right. He's worshiping right there, right then and there. And the Lord, I, I believe that to be God, doesn't stop him. If you're an angel of God, you mm. would stop them from doing that. You would be like, no, 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 no. That's, I'm the angel of God. You wouldn't do that. Mm. That's my first proof that this is God. My second proof that this was God was that this, the, the Lord incarnate tells Joshua to remove his sandals. You are in holy ground now. I don't know if my Bible stories listeners remember, when was the other time that the Lord has said this? Maybe you guys don't know in the room. Pause it and think about it. Okay, press play. Mm -hmm. Moses at the burning bush. Remember? Eden, Eden's in the room. Shout out to Eden. Eden, you were recording that episode with me. When he, God tells Moses to take off his sandals, you're now in the presence of the Lord. Mm. That had to have been, that for me is proof enough that Joshua, when writing this, m intended for you to know that this was the Lord. And I think that that point was really important because the Lord says, I am neither, I am neither you and I am neither them. That's important because he's not trying to have you think that I work for you, like, like nothing, like, no. You're in group with me. You're, you're connected to me. And I think that that's why that they kept that little part in there. It's important to read the Bible actively. Like why the heck did they keep this? Like it's only a couple verses, but why anytime God shows up, it's important mm -hmm. and it's your duty to examine why. God's reply when he says neither suggests more that Israel is on his side than he is on their side. A little bit of foreshadowing because these people, they mess up again, but stay tuned for next week's episode. Mm. And now the moment we've all been waiting for, the actual battle of Jericho. It's about to go down. We just hooked up with the Lord. We know that he wants us to sanctify ourselves and we know it's because we're about to go in there. It's the first territory that the Israelites have been commissioned to take over. But the Lord does something kind of funny. He asks them to do really weird things. Like you would think that the Lord would want them sharpen your weapons, uh, stretch. I don't know, whatever you do before stretch. battle. <laughs> <laughs> whatever you do before battle, but he doesn't. Let's hop into scripture. So uh, God tells Joshua that Jericho is theirs for the taking, but it's gotta be in a specific way. Scripture chapter six, verses two to five. Then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets and when you hear them sound a long blast of the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up and everyone straight in. Mm. What? <laughs> like he's literally telling the army to march around Jericho, around the walls of Jericho in this super succinct, specific way, blowing their trumpets and then the trumpets would be, would break the walls down. I, I remember reading that and thinking, why would God have us, have us do that? Have us act in those ways? Hold on, I gotta think about this because I didn't write this down. Hmm. 
I think that the reason why God was specific with his word, and I'm going to be honest with you, and this is just Brianna, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a theologian, okay? Read the book yourselves. But I think it was a way for God to have the people exercise their faith. Exercise their faith. How easy would it have been? The army? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to have you dancing around this wall, blowing the trumpet. That could be. You have to trust me. Trust that I have it covered. It was another opportunity for them to exercise their trust. Because of Joshua's great leadership, he was super organized. They did exactly what God said to a T. And to a T, it ends up happening. We hear a shout. We hear the trumpets and the walls go tumbling down. The people can't believe it. literally everything God said was going to happen, happened. And then they charge in and they burn the land of Jericho down. But who did they spare? Rahab. Rahab, Rahab and her family because they saw the scarlet cord. Um, they burned, so let's go to scripture. Uh, chapter six, verse 24. They burned the whole city and everything on it, but they put the silver and the gold and articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. This is important. And before I end this story, I want to tell you guys that Jericho had a lot of fancy things. They had Birkin bags, Lambos, jewelry, dollar bills, a bunch of stuff. And the Lord knew this. And the Lord told Joshua to tell the people, by the way, when you guys get there and you ransack, none of you are to take these goods and keep them for yourselves. He repeats it twice. What do we know about God who repeats? It's important. But one Israelite, by the name of Achan, takes some of the some of the goods and he hides it in secret. Mm. Mm. And that is where I'm going to end today's episode. Mm. On a cliffhanger. Mm. You're going to have to stay tuned for next week to see what happens because God's going to make him pay mm -hmm. in a serious way. Before we get into moral of the story, I just wanted to put a bow on the battle of Jericho. I think it's super important that we realize that the Israelite army had zero militia strategy. Zero. All they had was faith and trust in God. And what God said was going to happen, happened. Oh man, if I, was, if I was there, I'd be like so confused, but also so thankful. Like we weren't supposed to win. All these people that aren't supposed to be where they're at are winning. Yo, that is God. I see that today and I'm like, oh, that's God. Like when I see people and I'm like, what? How did you make it out? That's why we have an affinity for people who like make it out the street. Like they weren't supposed to win, but they win anyways. That's why I love Jay-Z. Like I don't even, I'm not even a fan of Jay-Z's music, but his story alone is compelling. Like to hear someone who made it out of the projects now be a billionaire. Yeah. Ah! We always root for the underdog. We always do. That's, that's, that had to have, that has to be God. And again, I'm a believer. I fear God. I am a Christian. I understand, but I see that in that. Listen, I'm, that, that's God. Okay. Atheist, atheist, <laughs> atheist, atheist, Diana. That's you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just know that that's God. Okay. Now at this point, Joshua, after the, the battle of Jericho, he, puts a curse on them and basically tells them, none of you are to rebuild this land, okay? None of you, understood? Pin on that too, because again, there's a whole lot of foreshadowing in the book of Joshua. And we find out that they attempt to rebuild it later. That's a future episode. And now moral of the story. Moral of the story is God's plans include us. God's plans include our active participation. And we can choose not to partake in God's love if we don't want. God will respect that. God respects our individuality. But that's your choice. To think that in ancient times, 
a message about God's miracles and God's delivering of uh, an entire race of people managed to get to the ears, the eyes and the hearts of a poor pagan prostitute in spite of her surroundings, in spite of her experiences, in spite of her beliefs, in spite of who she was supposed to be, she had faith in the Lord. She chose to doubt her doubts and trust in God. Even when we don't know, even when we're marching around a city we don't know with trumpets in the air moving in weird directions, even then, we're expected to trust. And we are well in our right to question and to feel like what we're doing is meaningless. But if you trust in God and if you make trust in something bigger, a practice, that looks like obedience, that looks like submission. And the outcome of that, the result of that is this, this deeply profound sense of purpose and joy. Sometimes what God requires of us in obedience is beyond human comprehension, beyond our capacity to even understand. Sometimes it feels like a lesson in learning to trust God with the outcome as opposed to thinking we can achieve it on our own. All right, guys, I have to pull out the book. We're going to end the moral of the story on a on scripture, which is the best way, because who cares what I have to say? The book is way more important than whatever comes out of my mouth. Um, now, this comes from one of my favorite letters in the Bible, Corinthians, for first Corinthians written by Paul. And uh, Apostle Paul says something that I think fits so nicely in this week's moral of the story. It comes from first uh, Corinthians chapter one, verse 25. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Ooh. Hey, Father. Oh, you know, I think it went well. You know, the crew enjoyed it. We talked about the prostitute. Love her. Yeah. Okay. You, you, want, me to, you want me to cover up? Okay, I'll just... All right, guys. I'll see you next week.